of liberal or NDP. The conservative movement in particular seems to have a lot of people who have been in communications but don't necessarily know what that means. Uh, and if the strategy of communications is to stifle or stop communication, that's a real problem when you're in opposition. Because when you're the government, you get media because you're the government. When you're in opposition, that's not the case. And so finding lines or stonewalling is not something that's going to work, and I, I'm not sure that it was particularly successful in government either. So you have all of these young, bright people in this movement who have great ideas. The ability to put people out there and to let that next generation uh, take the stage and think about how they're going to do things and take a refreshed approach, I think is something that could bring a lot of interesting ideas to your movement and a lot of interesting stories that get out there and communicate to people about who you are and what it is that you are trying to do. Um, the persecution complex. I came across this a lot, uh, and it still exists. And what I would often hear from people who were in their 20s was that under reform, the press gallery wasn't fair to them. They might have been in elementary school under reform. Um, so there's almost a generational inherited complex about who the media are, that the media are the enemy. Uh, look, we're not your friend. We're not here to make you look good. We're not here to tell the story that you want told. We're here to tell the stories that are unbiased, that are straightforward. But this idea uh, that the media is somehow the enemy and therefore you cut them off, you don't talk to them, you're hostile towards them. Staffers run away from media uh, in you know, the various watering holes of Ottawa where you've got other parties reaching out, communicating and connecting to people, establishing relationships. Here's the problem. If a journalist runs a story and there's something that's not quite right in it, it's a little bit off, uh, on a very tight deadline, and a phone call comes in from somebody who they've really never heard of or heard from, and that person is very aggressive with them, insisting that they've been spun, that their story is wrong and they need to change it. How likely do you think the journalist is to believe that person versus to think they're trying to spin them? There's been some kind of pre-existing relationship and communication there, uh, and there were certainly people in the conservative movement who had that kind of credibility that if they called, people would listen and say, you know, let me take a second look. Maybe that wasn't quite what I thought it was. Maybe I'll take a second look and see if there's another story here. But without any kind of a pre-existing relationship uh, or, or sense that you know who people are and can talk to them, that's not a possibility. So I'll keep it short and sweet at that, but uh, that's my big message is figure out what you're gonna communicate, which only you can do, but figure out how you're going to communicate it not from a place of um, building up the armaments and defenses and putting a moat around your castle, but from figuring out what you actually want to put out there and being willing to explain the ideas. Because people are smarter than you think. And the idea that you cannot explain a strategy, that you cannot explain a story, that you just need to make it go away, is something that doesn't really tell Canadians what you're about. It tells them more what you don't want to talk about. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much for, for having me, Jim, and it's a great treat to be here alongside some uh, fellow journalists who have uh, much, uh, much more impressive experience than I do, so it's a real honor to, uh, to be here with them. And uh, I, wanna, I think I want to build upon Mercedes' remarks, because I completely agree with them, and I just have one little point to make, but I think it's a vital point, and that's pointing out what I think was a major deficit in this recent campaign, and even really throughout the past 10 years, which is the importance and the power of positive storytelling. Now, I've been really reluctant in my writing and commentary to jump on this bandwagon about tone. Harper's tone, conservative tone, I just find it a little bit too much. And I think a lot of it is also the left trying to frame the debate in their favor when they say tone. Because I think what they mean by it is, there's a lot that the conservatives were doing that was mean and nasty, but they just think conservatives are mean and nasty in general. So they're trying to get you to go and just be more like them, concede territory. So I found that whole conversation a little cheesy, but I can't help acknowledge that there's this, there's this major grain of truth to it, but in a way that I think the right to recharge needs to repurpose it and, and make it their own. And what do I mean by this? I look back to for instance, all throughout the past 10 years, 
There were many, many things that I believe the Prime Minister, the previous Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, was right about. But you sort of had to come to that conclusion yourself. You had to intuit it. And you had to understand by yourself that that was the case. I don't think the party did a great job of saying to folks, here, I'm going to take your hand and let's go on this journey together. And I'm going to work with you and, and help you understand and come and go the distance to where you are to encourage you to come along on my ideas. I don't think we really saw that much at all because there was a lack, like I said, of positive storytelling. What do I mean by that? Probably if you're here in this room, you believe that all these policies you're advocating for are good policies. They're good news stories. So you've got this guy like, you know, remember when Jack Layton ran in 2011 and he was just, he just had this ear to ear grin and he was so excited to go across the country and tell people all these great ideas he had because he thought it would make their lives better. And he just couldn't stop talking about them and he couldn't stop smiling because he thought they were so powerful, wonderful, positive ideas. And Canadians got that. And I think that's one of the reasons that the NDP did so well in 2011 because it's just strong, unrelenting, positive message. And I think that by and large, conservatives really failed to deliver a message like that all across the past 10 years. And that, that key point I want to make is that if you truly believe that what you're saying is the good path forward, the positive path forward, that it's a way to make people's lives better, oh, I know these folks on the left, they're saying they're going to end poverty, but guess what? I've actually got this, I want to end poverty too, and I've got better ideas to do it. And you can't make me stop smiling about it, and you can't make me stop talking about it because I'm so passionate about it. And we're not getting that right now from conservatives. As a, as a media critic myself, or just the average folks I talk to at parties and family events who are apolitical, who are that middle that you're going to be chasing, they don't feel that. They don't feel that they're being taken by the hand and encouraged to go along on that trip because there's a positive message that's going to make their lives better. And I think that, that recharge, that tweak, that reboot, should probably be an integral part of the next few years forward. That's it. Well, as the senior citizen on this panel, I just want to point out that it's not only young aides who weren't born when the reform was on the Hill, a number of reporters were also in elementary school. So uh, maybe take that into account before saying you were hostile to Preston Manning. Me in grade two. God. Um, I just want to add about relationships. That when I do these things for journalism students and they ask, how do you cultivate sources? And I think it's a two-way street. I say, well, actually, the best way to cultivate a source is to talk to people when there's not a crisis and talk to them about other things than what you do and what they do for a living, where they went on holidays, uh, et cetera. Uh, for two reasons, they're more likely to call you back if they are in a crisis and you need to talk to them. And also, if you do talk to them and establish a relationship, you're going to know when they're lying to you. So just so you know <laughs> how these are. I, mean, I, too, have three points that I will touch on really briefly. Uh, they deal less with communications and, and a bit more with policy and body language. Uh, the first is you may have noticed that the, your party looks really comfortable in opposition. Sometimes uh, your MPs look happier in opposition than they did in government. That's probably good news that they're so good at opposition, but I think you should reflect on the fact that maybe in government, the Conservatives never stopped acting like an opposition party. And that goes to Anthony's point uh, that it always seemed more important to go on the attack against other parties or other ideas uh, than to actually put forward or defend conservative ideas uh, with positive arguments. Uh, so it's great to have you know, uh, the knack to be in opposition, but it is a mentality that was not lost. Uh, it's quite amazing that over a decade, it actually became a more entrenched, this opposition uh, mentality. The shiny bright objects on the other side of the aisle always seemed more interesting and then the shiny bright objects that the conservatives could have put forward and that ended up buried in omnibus bills or 
uh, not accessible or, or explained properly. My second point is on demographics, and, and that first point leads to when you look back on what has happened, uh, the campaign, how the right comes back, you might want to spend more time looking at how that decade evolved than how the last campaign evolved. But if you're going to look at the last campaign, I suggest you pay more attention to the voters you missed and to the voters you got. Uh, almost three million new voters this year, many of them were young people. They're not going to go away. If you look at Bernie Sanders in the US, a number of the people who are behind him are the young people who signed up for Barack Obama. When you vote once, you do come back. And they will change the political discourse, and you haven't been really talking to them. And one of my favorite points, I saw so many stories that bragged about how the conservatives did not want this single professional woman who lives in a city. Well, if you read the New York Magazine this week, you will find a cover story that tells you that uh, single women are now the most potent political force in America. They make up more than 50% of voters, and traditionally, they are more inclined to issues such as childcare, family balance policies, issues that have been identified to a progressive agenda. If you don't want to talk to them, you will be taking yourself out of the game. And finally, on so many of these issues that are of interest to this significant contingent of new voters and these single women, it's not that you have bad policies, it's that you don't have any. You're simply not competitive on any of those issues. And unless you want to start thinking about them, you are giving the progressive side of the political spectrum a huge gift. Thank you. I, I forgot what I was gonna say. <laughs> Uh, I want to begin with a caveat. Uh, uh, don't listen to anything I say. Father Raymond D'Souza is here, and it's always good to see him. And he reminds me that when I was here last year, I had just written a column in which I announced that Justin Trudeau had peaked and that it was all downhill from there. So, whatever. Um, I, I, I've, I've been enjoying the, uh, the months since October 19th because I uh, work at 130 Albert, uh, which is the same building as the Conservative uh, Party headquarters. And since October 19th, the young Conservative staffers that I meet in the, in the, in the elevator feel free to talk to me. Uh, it used to be like, just surreal things. John Geddes and I would be riding down in the elevator, and there'd be this person uh, leaning further and further into her, uh, uh, her phone. And, and we'd get a block out the door, and I'd say, I think that was Jenny Byrne. And, and, and I'd Google. I'd sit there in the World Exchange Googling her picture, and yeah, that's Jenny Byrne. I guess she dyed her hair. Um, but um, anyway, now people just say hi, and we, how are you doing? And it's very relaxed. And I think it's closer to what the Conservative Party was uh, uh, much more recently than a decade ago. Uh, it was actually what the Conservative Party was like when it was succeeding under Stephen Harper. So much of the party's success and uh, failure over the last decade is bound up in the personality of that man that um, uh, it's going to take uh, just inevitably and in the natural course of things a, a long time for the conservative movement to decide what's it wants to be, what it wants to be when it grows up. Um, in, in France, this is one of my favorite political analogies and, 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 and no one ever picks it up because it's so incredibly geeky. Uh, in France, Charles de Gaulle after the war wrote a constitution for a new French government with a strong president and it was so obviously written so that Charles de Gaulle would become the president, which he did. And then the question among people who watch politics was, can Gaullism survive de Gaulle? And then he uh, lost, uh, re resigned and died, and, and, and a new leader of his party was able to uh, take over, and, uh, and the answer was yes, it, it could. And then the question was, can Gaullism survive the Gaullists? Uh, could a socialist govern under the system that this center-right leader had, uh, had um, developed and Mitterrand became the president and France had good days and bad days, but the answer was yes. I mean, the, the question now is can Harperism survive Harper? But I think it's important to remember uh, some of the important things that he, that he contributed. At his best, when the party was gaining uh, in seats and popular vote in election after election, the Conservative Party was comfortable. It was comfortable with itself. It was comfortable with all Canadian conservatives, including progressive conservatives who had been strong uh, uh, um, 
contributors to the Mulroney uh, Progressive Conservative Party, including um, prairie populist conservatives who are, you know, maybe not super comfortable at the Rideau Club, but have ideas and energy and, and, uh, and help build the Reform Party and are not done yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, um, it was often fun to get to know everyone who was working around Jason Kenney because you, you would have uh, uh, strong Zionist uh, Jewish staffers who were really proud that the party was standing up for Israel. You would have uh, uh, gay libertarians. You would have uh, uh, an Iranian immigrant communications director who had run for the Canadian Alliance when he was 20 years old and was, and, and was really happy about the stances the party was taking around the, the world. And, uh, and, again, and on and on and on. You'd have people who wanted to be Dick Cheney when they grew up, and they were all happy working together because on, on, on some days, they, each of them had a... Um, uh, uh, a position that the party was taking that they thought they could support. It was a strong contrast from the days of the Clark and Mulroney conservative parties when people who called themselves conservatives at home and to their friends often felt that the party was ashamed of them. And I don't think that the conservative party should leave behind the sense that all conservatives can now feel comfortable in it from Jason Kenney to Peter McKay and a little bit to the left and right of, e of, of each of those. Uh, it would be folly to lose that. But the other thing that the Conservative Party had and lost while Stephen Harper was the leader was that it was comfortable to explaining to other people what it was up, up to and what it was for. When I wrote a book about Mr. Harper, I found long, detailed speeches about ideas that he had given before he became Conservative leader, and then none after he became the Conservative leader. And the, more, the longer that went on, uh, the more I wondered, what the hell? Uh, the construction of hegemony, the constant uh, explaining uh, to the people why you deserve to govern is not something you can replace with uh, snotty brat kids in t-shirts who push reporters off the section of the carpet that they're not supposed to be on. That's not the same thing. And uh, I, I hope you all uh, bear that in mind as you go forward. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so what, uh, what we're going to do now is um, have a, a lively question and answer period. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions just to give you time to get to the microphones. I think there's uh, four microphones there. If you, if you have a question, uh, we'll sort of go back and forth, and you can identify who on the panel you'd like to, to answer them. Um, just while you're, you're lining up at the mics, uh, what I am asking for is questions. Uh, if you have a speech that you want to give, <laughs> Uh, there will be a leadership race for the party uh, <laughs> coming up, and you're welcome to join that. But we're just hoping to get some, some questions here. So in, uh, I'll maybe start off. Um, you know, there was a theme that ran throughout a lot of your comments talking about the importance of communications, which kind of rings true to me because nobody ever came uh, into a meeting after an event went south and ever said, you know what, we needed more research. It was always a problem with communications. We didn't communicate it. We needed better messages. Nobody ever, ever blamed research. Um, but you know, there, that was a theme, the need for storytelling, the need for messages. Anthony, you said uh, the need to smile a bit more. We actually identified that for Stephen Harper and put smile more in his scripts. But then we found out that it was actually scaring small children. <laughs> so we, we took that out. But I guess what I'm interested in is, so is it a, is it a, when we talk about the need to recharge uh, the right or recharge the conservative movement, um, is, it, is it simply a matter of, of style? Um, is it a matter of substance that we have to look at? Or is there a structural um, problem that the party uh, needs to address? So maybe, maybe I'll start with Paul this time and work my way down. Um. I think style has a lot to do with it, um, but I also think that uh, any party that wins, including the Trudeau Liberals recently, has to occupy a part of the political spectrum that is denied to the other parties or that the other parties deny themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, need, you need a base. You need, you need a reason for people to vote for you. Uh, and that's why I think the Conservative Party needs to be pretty conservative. Uh, and, um, uh, but from that base, you need to talk to all Canadians. You need to actually have an answer on all the issues that a government...